If you've ever seen a commercial for the chip brand Ruffles, you've likely heard their slogan, Ruffles have ridges. Just like these crispy potato snacks, German tanks during World War II around 1943 also bore some strange ridges. Unfortunately, this video was not sponsored by Ruffles, but nonetheless we will be discussing the reason Nazi Germany chose to slather their tanks in a strange mixture to create the distinct textured look on mid and late war tanks. As I just mentioned, today's video is not sponsored by anyone, but I do want to give a quick mention to Odyssey where I have my YouTube content mirrored. Odyssey is by far one of the most promising YouTube alternatives and is completely ad-free so you can watch my videos there at no cost. They even still have visible dislikes. If you want to give me a follow there, I'd greatly appreciate it as it's my backup in case anything were to happen to this channel, so check out the link to that in the description. Now back to what you clicked on this video for. Produced by the Chemische Werk Zimmer Company in Berlin, this coating was made up of 25% polyvinyl acetate, 10% wood filler, 40% barium sulfate, 10% zinc sulfide, and 15% ochre pigment. Known as Zimmerit, its use was widespread on German armor during the mid and late war. Aside from adding a rough looking texture to the tanks, which likely helped with camouflaging the machines, what benefit could adding this to every vehicle leaving the factory provide? Well, similar to the much larger armored warships prowling the seas, tanks were primarily made out of armored steel, which is magnetic. To combat this, a technique called degaussing was common, which greatly reduced the magnetic field of a ship. However, this required a complex system of wires, which would be far too impractical for use on tanks. Still, magnetic anti-tank mines did exist, and the Germans were convinced it was necessary to protect their armored vehicles against this threat. Supposedly, this was caused by the introduction of the haft Holodung anti-tank weapon in 1942 which utilized magnets to attach a shaped charge to enemy tanks. Fearing the Soviets could easily copy this design if any were captured, this caused the typical German over-engineering for a solution. Unlike the degaussing method, Zimmer itself did not actually demagnetize the tank, but rather acted as a sort of buffer to prevent a magnetic attraction causing the mine to fail to stick. Beginning in December of 1943, German tanks leaving the factory bore this new ridged coating. Despite my over-engineering joke, this was actually a fairly simple process compared to much of Germany's tank production. As usual, the tanks would be coated with an anti-corrosive primer, usually a distinct red color, followed by the Zimmerit. When it arrived for application, the coating had a paste-like consistency and had a solvent mixed into it which reportedly smelled like acetone. Most likely, this was done to prevent it from hardening during transport. When it came time to put on the vehicle, it would be applied in two coats using metal trowels. The first coat was 5mm thick and was applied in squares marked out using the trowel. Following this, the coating would need to dry for 24 hours before applying the second coat. The base coat of squares would assist the second thinner coat in sticking and the distinct ridges were added using a metal comb. This wavy pattern helped provide that rough camouflage finish and a more difficult surface for mines to contact with. After this second coating was completed, it would be dried using gas blowtorches. The drying process, which took about an hour per tank, hardened the material and removed the solvent from it, creating a texture said to be similar to compressed sawdust. If left to dry without the use of a torch, it would take 8 days for the material to fully harden, and considering the desperate need for tanks, this was not an option. It's important to note that one source puts the initial drying time for the base coat at only 4 hours. With the 24 hour figure coming from a British report on the subject dating from 1945, this does seem to be the more believable figure. It is possible though that in some cases, application differed due to the supply issues or attempts to speed up production, so I can't say for certain. Regardless, the application was a simple process which did not require experienced workers, but did still add several days to the production process. The only real issue would be if a soft spot was left in the Zimmerit which could come off the vehicle. However, if properly hardened, this was far from a concern as even when struck by projectiles, very little of the coating would be knocked off the armor. It's even reported that some tanks dug up decades after the war still bore trace amounts of Zimmerit on them. Unfortunately, despite knowing virtually every detail about the production and application process, it is not clear how effective Zimmerit was in combat. Despite the German fears, neither Soviet nor Allied troops were issued with magnetic mines with only a few reports of captured German mines being used. 
Britain also supplied around 159,000 clam magnetic charges to the USSR, but not much is known about their usage, and it only contained about 8 ounces of TNT, which likely would not cause significant damage unless placed on the suspension or another weak point on the tank. Some evidence was found from Soviet tests which believed the coating to be some form of protection from Molotov cocktails or a form of camouflage. Strangely, they found the Zimrit to consist of 53% barium sulfate, 16-17% to quartz, 27% organic material, with the final 3% unidentified. Since this is different from the actual mixture the German records show, it's possible their samples may have been misidentified or contaminated somehow. Either way, the Soviets hypothesized that the ridges would concentrate liquid or heat from flammable liquids, causing the coating to melt and extinguish the flames. Although obviously this was not the intention of the coating, it was later found by the British that a vehicle coated in Zimrit when hit by a flamethrower would remain at a survivable temperature inside, whereas an uncoated tank would get so hot that the ammo could explode. Although once again, the increased camouflage was noted and similar coatings were tested both before and after over 100 tons of Zimrit was captured in Germany for concealment purposes, the anti-magnetic properties were never fully tested but the British found that the ridges did not add any noticeable increase in protection aside from concealment. Some of the captured Zimrit was shipped to Australia at the end of the war for trials against Japanese magnetic mines but the war was over before it was tested. Even the use of Zimrit by the Germans was short-lived, with it being phased out in September of 1944. The reason for this is quite ironic, as it was rumored to pose a fire hazard and an order went out to halt application at the factories. This was later found to be untrue, but the halt on applications remained, likely due to the coating not being needed and adding unnecessary man-hours to much-needed tank production. Realistically, with only the Axis powers using magnetic mines in large quantities, the coating only served to protect them from their own weapons anyways, so why waste the resources on it? In the end, Zimmer itself was fairly unsuccessful in its intended role and was not used post-war due to the magnetic mines being made obsolete by portable launchers such as the Bazooka and RPG among others. Similar coatings, however, live on to this day with various textured substances being used on many modern tanks to increase concealment or aid in lowering thermal signatures. Even during the Second World War, similar applications were attempted with the Soviets and Americans using concrete as both additional armor and protection against mines. I actually have a full video that you can watch after this one on that topic. The Americans in particular tried a number of solutions to the Japanese magnetic mines ranging from spikes to aluminum plates, but I plan to cover those in a future video along with other Pacific Field mods. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more topics like this, let me know by liking the video or leaving a comment telling me what I should cover in the future. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already and ring the bell so you don't miss any of my uploads. Be sure to check out Odyssey as well using the link in the description I mentioned earlier. Hope to see you there.